Good morning. Welcome to our pre-recorded service at St. Mark. Today happens to be Thursday, but today that you're viewing this is Sunday the 22nd, and so we're happy to have you with us. We have several people involved today. Thank you, Bob, for playing. We are grateful, uh, Julie Eshelman, also for reading our lessons today, for Pastor Chad, and also Jill, who's helping with the recording of all this. So a lot of people are participating in our recording today, and we're delighted that we can bring this to you on Sunday the 22nd. And we hope that this builds a sense of community here. Even though we're not present to worship, we are together in the spirit on this day. Let's begin with the prayer of the day. And so join me as we pray. Bend your ear to our prayers, Lord Christ, and come among us. By your gracious life and death for us, bring light into the darkness of our hearts and anoint us with your spirit, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson from 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you, and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then sent out and went to Ramah. The second lesson, Ephesians 5, 8 through 14. For once you were in darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you.
The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the ninth chapter. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Salom, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. But he kept saying, I am the man. But they kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought the Pharisees, the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received the sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that he is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind. And they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciple? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. 
He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. This is the Gospel of the Lord. There's an old saying, you can't see the forest for the trees. It's a reference to those people who are so involved in the minute details of any particular issue that they lose sight of the big picture. This saying I discovered dates as far back as the 1500s when apparently there were a lot more trees to look at. In today's gospel, there's a whole bunch of people who can't see the forest for the trees. Here's a man who has been blind from birth. And what was the response of Jesus' disciples? They launch into this aloof discussion with Jesus of who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. You're blind? Tough luck, fella. Now, let's the rest of us get together and see if we can figure out the moral origins of this guy's dilemma. Jesus responds that no individual sin is at stake here. This is a matter of God revealing God's work in this man. Jesus then suddenly spits on the ground, mixes it with his saliva, applies this muddy paste to the man's eyes, and miraculously heals his blindness. And with that, Jesus' critics, of course, immediately get into the act. And there's this huge argument among all of them with all kinds of rancorous speculation and debate. And so it continues, failing to see the forest for the trees. Even as our Lenten worship and fellowship is suspended, we strive to take a closer look at ourselves and our relationship with God. And that examination includes the many, many rules and expectations that we establish to manage our lives. What are some of the things we do and don't do because of the way we see ourselves? And here's a harder question. How blind are we regarding those things that we insist upon as being significant and necessary? And how do we conduct ourselves, both in words and deeds, as we confront this coronavirus pandemic in our very midst? Are we too failing to see the forest for the trees as we respond? These are the urgent questions that we might be asking right now. And I think Paul offers us some excellent guidance in his letter to the Ephesians, which Julie read this morning. He encourages us to live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light is found that is all that is good and right and true. And then he urges, try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. We are then addressed with a stunning command, Sleeper, awake! Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. What could this possibly mean for us in these days of such upheaval and change? And how might we awaken and live as children of the light. Let me share with you a story that I came across that I, speaks, that I think speaks so well to our situation together. A woman set out traveling through the villages of Germany, and one Sunday evening she arrived at a small, quaint village. She got a room at the local inn right next to the public square, and once she was settled in, she opened up her tourist guidebook. As she was reading about the village, she suddenly heard church bells in the distance. And she looked through her guidebook where it mentioned that there was a 12th century church there. 
Glancing out her window, she saw a number of villagers hurrying in the direction of the bells, each carrying an antique lamp. Her curiosity was aroused, and so she set out to join the procession, heading toward the church. On the step of the church, she approached an elderly woman and asked what she was carrying and why. And the woman replied, this is a very special lamp. We carry these to church to keep alive a tradition dating back to the Reformation when there was no other way of lighting our church. Back then, the Duke made a provision in his will that every villager should be given a lamp, which he or she was to bring to church on Sunday evenings. The worshiper would then light the lamp from a candle in the narthex, proceed to his or her seat, placing the lamp in a special holder. Of course, nowadays it's not very convenient to use these lamps to light the church, but we still do, and everyone who attends the sanctuary makes it that much brighter. And if on a Sunday evening you're tempted to stay away, you must live with the knowledge that there will be that much less light in the church for others. And with that admission, she turned and entered the church. The tourist followed and took a seat in an empty pew. It was fairly dark back there, but she was able to see a nameplate attached to the pew. And as she struggled to read it in the darkness, she discovered that this was Anna Schilling's place. And she wondered, who is Anna Schilling? And why is she not here with her lamp tonight? Anna, your light is missing. There is but darkness in this place where your light ought to be. Anna, remember what you are. You are a bearer of light. You are much more. You are a light. That's exactly the language that Paul used to remind the Ephesians. You now belong to Christ, and Christ is in you. He is the light of the world that makes you to be light. People of St. Mark, remember that you are light in these dark days of coronavirus fear and chaos. And if you remember that truth, and if you understand its meaning, you'll likewise know that it affects everything around you. What you do or don't do, what you say, how you think about an issue, and even how you view the world and your responses to it. You have been enlightened in these dark pandemic days to do so much more than simply be a carrier of a lamp to St. Mark. Just as generations before us have been lighting our way, you and I are here today to light the world for others. And by God's grace, to help them see God's light in Christ, the forest for the trees. Let us pray. Lord, we are grateful that you bring light into our lives. We are grateful that you encourage us to see much more than simply the many trees in front of us, but the greater work that you are doing in your forest, the world. Help us again today on this Sunday as we are separated from one another, watching this service in our homes. We pray, Lord, that we would be the light wherever we are, that as we venture out into the world, we would carry our lamps of the gospel with us. May our light burn brightly, and may that light shine upon the world and bring darkness into a new light. In your name we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of insight, open the hearts of the church and the world to all who testify to your deeds of power. Raise up voices in your church that are often silenced or overlooked due to age, gender expression, race, or economic status. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of insight, bring peace to all people and nations. Raise up leaders who seek goodness, righteousness, and truth on behalf of all. Bring justice and comfort to all whose lives have been turned upside down. Hear us, O God. Your mercy mercy is great. God of insight, you care for our needs even before we ask. Come quickly to all who seek prayer this day, especially Gary Campbell, Bill Jennings, Joe Fink, Pam Catrill, Tim Pankovich, Betty Patterson, Jason Carlson, Beverly Wright, Jerry Kazaniga, Keith Hagestad, David Young, the family and friends of St. Mark people, those who serve in the military and their families, all who are ill due to the coronavirus and those whose lives have been upturned, and all those we name within our hearts. Accomplish healing through the work of doctors, nurses, researchers, departments of health, and all who tend to human bodies. Hear us, O God. Your mercy mercy is great. great. God of insight, help this assembly lift up the unique gifts of each person, no matter their physical capability, cognitive ability, or sensory need. Help us to be creative and brave in making our ministries accessible to all. Hear us, O God. Your Your mercy mercy is is great. great. According to your steadfast love, O God, hear these and all our prayers as we commend them to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you.